If you're new to understanding and observing God's holy days, or maybe you haven't even gotten there yet, maybe you heard a counterfeit narrative in counterfeit Christianity regarding the offering of first fruits that, or, or regarding the holy days that they've already been fulfilled and therefore we don't observe them anymore. They were just for Jews and not for Christians. The first thing I want you to consider is the fact that when God stated that we were to observe certain holy days, some of those holy days had already been fulfilled. The Festival of Tabernacles, for example, you are to live in temporary shelters so that you remember that I had you live in temporary shelters when you were in the wilderness. Now, that particular holy day is to be observed by both Christians and Jews or native-born Israelites because ultimately Christianity, Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism. If you're a Jew and you're promised a Messiah and then you accept that Messiah and you become a Christian, it doesn't take away from the fact that you are also a Jew, that you're still a Jew. No one was like, well, should I be called a Christian or should I be called a Jew? No, Christians understand, true Christians understand that the word says that a Jew is one who is circumcised inwardly, circumcision of the heart. So true Christians are Jews and true Jews are Christians. God's not concerned about ethnicity or the place you were born or the place you're living right now. The Passover had already been fulfilled when God said you are to observe this as a lasting ordinance from generation to generation wherever you live. So, and with the, with the Festival of Tabernacles, one thing that I do want to say is that it's the only holy day that says all native-born Israelites are to live in temporary shelters. Otherwise, we're all supposed to be observing these holy days. And it even we even see in Ezekiel when see you know when looking at the third temple that these holy days are being observed. We see in the New Testament that these holy days are being observed. Day of Atonement, the Passover, they are observing these holy days. They were not abolished. We see as well in Zechariah 14 that it says, then the survivors from all nations that have attacked Jerusalem. So this is in the fulfillment of the age. This is like after the resurrection, all the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. If any of the peoples of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, they will have no rain. If the Egyptian people do not go up to take part, they will have no rain. The Lord will bring on them the plague he inflicts on the nations that do not go up to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that do not go up to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. I mean, it's pretty clear. So I don't know where these ideas are coming from. Um, but I do know, I, I will tell you one thing. It's coming from wickedness. It's coming from the evil one because it is a deception. The Bible itself, God himself, has been clear that you are to celebrate this from generation to generation as a lasting ordinance wherever you live. So with that made clear, I want to talk about another false doctrine that has been perpetuated in counterfeit Christianity, and that is that the offering of first fruits took place three days after Jesus was crucified or when he ascended to the Father. Neither is true. Neither is true. So you know that I've spoken many times in these videos regarding God's Sabbaths and holy days and new moons, and that you can't possibly observe his Sabbath or his holy days correctly if you're not observing new moon, because everything is counted down from the new moon. God doesn't have named days in the Bible. What he has are numbered days from the new moon. He also does not have a relentless set of seven day weeks. What he has is the new moon being a rest day, and then the next day is a work day, and you have six of those, and then a rest day, six of those and a rest day, and he has a 30-day month. So it's impossible to have a relentless set of seven-day weeks because 30 is not evenly divisible by seven. You have the first day being a rest day, then you have four weeks, and then you have a work day, and then and that's the last day of the month. And then you have a rest day, and it starts all over again with that rest day. There is some variation on a couple of the holy day months, but in general, that's the sequence. That is the typical sequence of a month. Now, we know that 
with a 30 day month and a 360 day year, that what is going to happen is that these months are going to end up at any time of the year. So previously, I believe there were spring holy days and fall holy days, and that's how I separated them, and that's how I spoke about them, but that's incorrect. And the reason why we have believed that is because we prostituted ourselves to the Gregorian calendar of the Harlot Catholic Church, and because those calling themselves Jews who are of Reformed Judaism and are not Jews, prostituted God's calendar to the Harlot Catholic Church. And so the only concept we've had is of a calendar that is both seasonal, that in which the months correlate to seasons, but that is not what we have on God's calendar. So you can have Passover ending up in every single season in the seasonal year. We do know that the first, when the Israelites went into the promised land, that Passover occurred in spring. And we know that when Jesus was crucified, that Passover occurred in spring. And the reason we know that is because of the proximity of Passover to the festival of weeks or Pentecost. So we know that for those particular years, they did occur during the the season that we're used to celebrating Passover in, if we're even celebrating Passover. Most people are calling Easter Passover, which is not accurate. There is no Easter in the Bible. Easter is a pagan holiday of the world. So regarding the offering of first fruits, what people have done, and this is the danger in taking taking scripture and interpreting it carnally and just plugging in or putting together a puzzle piece cross-referencing words, but not taking into account, not actually putting first and foremost the heart of God. What counterfeit Christianity has done is said, oh, first fruits. Okay, so Jesus is the first fruits. Therefore, the offering of first fruits is referring to Jesus. It's not. That's not even the way that God stated it. I can see why people would think that, and I'm saying that very intentionally, why they would think that, why they would interpret that in their carnality, because what they're doing is trying to understand what God has said with their carnality. Can you understand what God has said with your carnality? No. The Holy Spirit doesn't live in your carnality. The Holy Spirit lives in your heart. We, we've been told in Ezekiel 11 and 36 that God is going to remove our heart of stone place in us a heart of flesh, and then place his spirit in our heart and move us to follow his laws and keep his decrees. God is spirit. God is not carnal. So he's not speaking to you, counseling you, instructing you in your carnality, particularly since he rebukes carnality. He rebukes those who are wise of the world and tells you not to live in your flesh. So with that said, What is the implication? Well, the implication is if he's in your heart, that's where you need to be. And the implication is if he's spirit, then he's speaking to your spirit, and that's where you need to be. And when Jesus says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, where do you need to be? Where do you need to live? Where do you need to understand and communicate with God? In the spirit, in your heart. You communicate with him from your spirit to his spirit. In that place where you're willing, become like a child. And he's ministering to you and cleaning you up in your heart. That's where he's doing the work. You're not going to understand him with your carnality. So the other day I was reading, uh, I was reading 2 Kings chapter 4, and I came across this passage that I want to read to you. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 42. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God 20 loaves of barley baked barley bread baked from the first ripe grain, first ripe grain. I want you to remember that along with some heads of new grain. And by the way, we're talking about barley specifically, the first ripe grain, along with some heads of new grain, give it to the people to eat. Elisha said, how can I set this before a hundred men? His servant asked, but Elisha answered, give it to the people to eat for this is what the Lord says. They will eat and have some left over. Then he set it before them. And they ate and had some left over according to the word of the Lord. Okay, so 20 loaves of barley, bread, 
that feeds a hundred men. Does that remind you of any stories in the Bible? Jesus feeding the 4,000, Jesus feeding the 5,000. So this is something that should come to mind as we're, as we're reading this. But see, I observe God's holy days. And so I know that if you're eating the first of the ripe grain and new heads of grain, I know you're doing that during the offering of first fruits. How do I know you're doing that? Well, let's go to Leviticus 23. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land I'm going to give you and you reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain you harvest. He is to wave the sheaf before the Lord so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. On the day you wave the sheaf, you must sacrifice. Then he goes into the sacrifices. We're going to go down to verse 14. You must not eat any bread or roasted or new grain until the very day you bring this offering to your God. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come wherever you live. So I know that if that's what they're doing, that this is during the spring. Why do I know that? Because in Joshua 5, we know that this occurred during the spring. And that's when it is to be uh, that they entered the land during the spring. And that is when this that's the season that this barley harvest is to be observed in the offering of first fruits. There are technically two barley harvests, one in the spring, one in the fall. But here you're celebrating the first fruits of the season and of the seasonal year. So I know that Second Kings 4 is talking about the offering of first fruits. And I know that they would not have been eating that bread until the offering of first fruits. And if they're eating the first of it, then they just observed the offering of first fruits. Because it would be kind of silly to celebrate the offering of first fruits and not eat that subsequent to bringing that offering. Joshua 5 verse 10 tells me that on the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. So what month is this? We're talking about Aviv, sometimes referred to as Abib or Nasan. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. Well, what did Leviticus 23 say? It said, when you enter the land, I'm going to give you and you reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain you harvest. And then in verse 14, it said, you must not eat any bread or roasted or new grain until the very day you bring this offering to your God. So I know what to expect in Joshua 5. I know that when they do this, they need to bring that offering before they even eat it. So if it says in verse 11, the day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land. And I know from, from Leviticus 23 that this is to occur the day after the Sabbath. And this says the day after the Passover. Well, it could not be referring to the day after the 14th because the day after the 14th is the 15th in which you are commanded to observe a Sabbath. And the offering of first fruits need to, needs to occur after a Sabbath. But in Luke 22, verse 1, it says, Now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching. So this is telling me that the festival of unleavened bread is also the Passover. And so with this understanding, I know that from observing Passover, not Easter, because you don't get this from Easter. I know from observing Passover that the 14th is the day that the lamb was slaughtered, was sacrificed, that the 15th is a Sabbath and the 21st is a Sabbath and that for seven days I'm eating unleavened bread and technically eight because you're eating unleavened bread also on the 14th. But God stated it this way, for seven days you're gonna eat unleavened bread and then on the 21st, that's going to also be a Sabbath. So I know that after the festival of unleavened bread, which is the Passover, that's when the first offering of first fruits was. So that means it was the 22nd of that month. Now, is it going to be the 22nd of every Aviv, Aviv, Nisan? No, but I know that because, and, and why is it not going to be? Because I just told you on a 360 day calendar, the Passover is going to make its rounds through every season on the seasonal year. It is not the same as the Gregorian calendar and it's not the same as the counterfeit so-called Hebrew calendar that is put out by Reformed Judaism. So now if the command is to observe this the day after the Sabbath, then I'm going to know 
that every year when I harvest that barley during that spring season, that on the 22nd, if it's Aviv, I will harvest it on the 22nd of the month. And how am I going to know when the 22nd is? I'm going to know based on the moon. And if it's not in the month of Aviv, I'm going to harvest it on the 23rd. Why would I harvest it on the 23rd? Because it's the day after the Sabbath. And that's when I'm going to bring that offering of first fruits to God. That's when I'm going to harvest. That's when I'm going to partake of the roasted grain and unleavened bread for the first time of that season. So see, these are some things that you cannot understand by just putting together a picture in scripture. And it may seem to you like I'm showing you over here and then I'm showing you over there in scripture and that I put this together as a puzzle piece. But you need to understand that that is not what I've done and that God has revealed this to me through the paradigm he has built in me, the repertoire he's built in me as a result of obedience, as a result of me obeying what he has established. He has spoken into the paradigm that he's built in me. As a result of studying his word and rending my heart to wanting to understand rather than just reading this and passively, you know, in this passive carnal way, and then trying to put together, you know, some sort of like the superficial details of a story, you'll never get understanding that way. You must, what is the first commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And if you love him, then when you are reading these things in scripture, you're going to think, well, I'd like to do this if it was important to God. I'd like to understand why this is important to God. And through that posture of your heart, through understanding and love and a desire to understand more about him because you love him, you're going to be bestowed wisdom and he will lead you in scripture and he will not only show you these different things, but he will cause you to have wisdom and he will put the picture together for you. It has to be a heart issue. And remember, that's the place that you're going to be justified. So it makes sense that that would be the way that he's going to reveal to you. Okay, so we know what he's commanded in Leviticus 23. We know that the day after the Passover had to have been the 22nd of Aviv in the spring. And so on God's calendar, if you don't know what, you know, if you have, God's holy days are broken up into date-specific holy days and they're broken up into season-specific holy days. Now with a date-specific holy day, as long as you know the date, you're good. But with a season-specific holy day, you need to know both the season and the numerical date, not necessarily the month. The month is not going to factor into that because you could have any month in that particular season. But as long as you know when the 22nd or the 23rd are based on the moon, then you'll know when you're supposed to harvest that barley. And by the way, you'll always know when you're supposed to harvest the wheat as well because that'll be on the 16th day of the month. Now remember that you're counting down weeks and these are not consecutive seven-day weeks. So you don't know how many days from the barley harvest to the wheat harvest that you're harvesting because God didn't state it like that. God stated it in a way that would be really peculiar to us. He said, count down seven weeks up to the 50th day. If he wanted us to count down 50 days, he would have just said, count down 50 days. But he didn't say that. He said, count down seven weeks to the 50th day. And the reason he stated it like that is because between those weeks, there's that first day and the last day of the month. Remember that a 30-day month is not divisible, evenly divisible by seven. So you have the first day as a rest day, which is not a, that's not part of a week. And you have the last day as a work day, and that's also not part of a week because a week is defined as seven days, seven days, six days being of work and one day of rest. Those don't fit that description. So when you're counting down weeks from the 22nd, you're going to have one last week in that month, and then you're going to have two days in between, and then you're going to have another set of four day, excuse me, of four weeks, which is going to bring you to five weeks, then you're going to have two days in between, and then you're going to have another two weeks, 
in that month. And there is the day after the Sabbath, your festival of weeks. So let's look at that. So two weeks into God's month, you have the festival of weeks. So you have the first day being a rest day, then 14 days, and that would bring you to what? The 15th. And the stipulation is the day after the Sabbath. So the 15th being a Sabbath, then the day after the Sabbath would be the 16th. It's always going to be on the 16th. Nothing's going to mess it up. If if you have the offering of first fruits being on the 22nd or the 23rd, no big deal because you're counting down weeks, not days. Okay, but I want to get back to the topic of the video, which is what God was raising up for me as I was reading 2 Kings chapter 4. So seeing that Elisha, God performed this miracle through Elisha. He fed a hundred men on 20 barley loaves, and there was even some left over after the men ate. So this should make you think, okay, Jesus did this. And we know this, we know the story. We know the story of the 4,000 and the 5,000. We know that after Jesus fed them, just got done feeding them manna from heaven that he knew that they didn't believe. And he said, and, and, and he went off and they, they caught up with him. And they, he said to them, you're looking for me because not because you believe, but because you ate and had your fill. And they said, our ancestors were fed manna from heaven. What miracle are you going to perform so that we may know and believe? He just got done doing it. Like, can you imagine how what he must have been thinking? <laughs> he just got done doing that very miracle and they, they can't understand. And he tells them that he was the manna from heaven and that they need to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, that he is the bread that leads to, that, that um, he is the bread of life, that their ancestors ate bread in the wilderness and they died, but that those who eat from him will never die. They will have eternal life. And, and they just can't understand. The majority of them can't understand and they're falling off. You know, these disciples are falling off. They're like, this is too hard of a teaching. Who can understand it? And you remember in the book of John that this is when Jesus turns to his apostles and he says, you're going to leave too. And Peter says, no, you have the words that lead to eternal life. We've believed. Where else would we go? Okay, so we remember that story, but that's not quite it's it's not where the Holy Spirit wasn't taking me any, anywhere with that, at least not in the way of understanding the correlations. So I leaned in a little bit more, kept asking him, kept sitting with him, kept rending my heart and actually talk, you know, even talking about it out loud with him and saying, OK, these are the things that I know, asking him the questions that I had and ultimately going back to that story of Levit of the command stipulated in Leviticus 23 and just rending my heart. Why would this have been important to him when they entered that land? For them to make sure that they're bringing the sheaf of the wave offering before they eat anything. You know, I imagine that after 40 years of eating manna, quail, and water in the wilderness, they probably were kind of interested in eating some other things. And they could have come into the land and run after, you know, oh, look at the harvest, look at the bounty. Let's eat, let's make the, and, and completely forgotten and not reflected on all of the things that God had done for them and what and this fulfillment of what he was doing right now. They needed to pause for a minute and acknowledge him and thank him and think about all of the things that God had taught them from, you know, picking that manna each day and not and only taking what they needed and everyone having enough. No one had too much and no one had too little. And on the days that they weren't trusting him and they were thinking, well, I'm going to get a little extra. I'm going to store this away. What did he do? He tested them. He trained them. He disciplined them to believe that he would give them just enough for each day, their daily bread. And on the sixth day, he commanded that they get enough for two days. And miraculously, there was no maggots there were no there was no stench that was sent to the manna that they collected so he was teaching them he was disciplining them to live the way that he said to live to not be concerned about their storehouses and self and hoarding luke 12 verse 13 someone in the crowd said to him teacher tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me jesus replied man who appointed me judge a judge or arbiter between you then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. 
and he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. What is God teaching here? Obviously, this is a parable. It's not something that necessarily has happened, but he's stating it as something that we need to understand regarding the heart of God, regarding what God deems to be righteous and what he deems to be wicked. And so this idea that we're going to save, save up, and then we'll have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. You know, I worked in, um, I had I had a few different uh, specialties in psychology. And one of the specialties that I had was in working with older adults. And I had contracts with these different facilities. And, and it, I had this opportunity to work with many older adults who were now living in board and cares and skilled nursing facilities and assisted living. And I heard so many stories of people working all their lives, 12 hour days, you know, missing out on their kids growing up on the, the, you know, being with the person they married with their, with their spouse, missing out on all this for something that we call here in America, the American dream. And it's not much of a dream because what I saw, what I heard, was story after story of older adults, now older adults, living in these homes, and their spouse had gotten some sort of disease, illness, died early. Their money went to medical treatment for their spouse, and now their 12-hour-a-day labor is going to paying these different, these various facilities who are robbing them blind, by the way. And this is their life. Do you think that's what they planned for all that time? That they were working 12-hour days and missing out on their children growing up and being with their spouse? And God forbid, understanding the life that God set them aside to set them apart to live, the purpose for which he intended them in his kingdom, that was what was important, working 12-hour days for what? You get old and you can hardly move around to do all the things you thought you were going to do. What do you think you're going to do? Go paragliding or something? I had enormous wealth and I got sick. I wasn't enjoying my daughter. I took her shopping and had all this, you know, time to go and spend money with and on her. We weren't spending quality time. That's not quality, especially when you're spiritually sick and you can offer nothing that's important to your child. So maybe the parable doesn't happen exactly as Jesus stated it here. And maybe it does in some cases. But the parable happens. The consequences happen. God does let you know what a fool you are for trusting in any of that because he can wash it away with a flood. He can bring you to the brink of death to where you can't even enjoy any of that. To where no amount of money can pay for your health. But there are plenty of charlatans in medicine who will take your money and promise you health. That was my story. God wants you to trust him. He wants you to believe that he will provide and to not follow the ways of these pagan nations that you have everything ahead of time and then you say, praise God, I'm rich, as though God actually factors into your heart at all. Praise God, I have a savings, as though your hope and your faith and your trust is in God at all. It's in your savings. It's in that storehouse on which you've placed your hope. It's so easy to praise God when you got everything up front, isn't it? That's not what God established. 2 Corinthians 8. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches in the midst of a very severe trial. Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. We're not talking about tithing, by the way, guys, and we're not talking about different denominations. We're talking about different assemblies in Macedonia. That's what the churches are. 
And we're not talking about tithing because tithing has been fulfilled through sacrifice. Tithing was always part of sacrifice. We're talking about collections that were made for the poor. So don't misunderstand based on what these counterfeit churches are doing. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege, the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then by the will of God, also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am commanding you, but I want to test the, the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Listen to this again. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Who are the others? The Macedonians. He's talking to people in Corinth, and he's saying, I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. And why is he doing that? Well, they have a different covenant than we do. No, they don't. There is no favoritism. There's no separate covenant. There is one covenant. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... Yet for your sake, he became poor. Though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor. So that through, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. According to your means. So same covenant but according to your means. That's a heart issue, isn't it? Because you don't have a template of like a box to check. It's according to your means. So you have to go sort that through with God. What do you want me to give? For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. If the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Perhaps you'll remember this story in Mark 12. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were being put, and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Okay, so this is tithing because this is prior to Jesus dying prior to his sacrifice. What Paul is talking about in the New Testament is not tithing. It is about sharing with the poor. And he's saying, if there's willingness there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. He does not say the gift is acceptable according to the bone you throw God, okay? Because ultimately you're doing this for God. As long as you've checked off the box, that isn't what he's saying. I know someone who used to say, if I was rich, I would just give the money to the poor. But that person wouldn't even give what they had at that time. They weren't even willing to give according to what they had at the time. That's a lie. And you can't say, oh, well, God knows my heart. He knows what I would do because you only deceive yourself. And you can't then start making some money and saying, well, I, I, you know, I just don't have, I don't have anything. And I'm still taking it up with God. What do you want me to give? Show me if there's something in my possessions that you would like me to give. And God established this in sacrifice as well. The rich gave in accordance to what they had. They gave bulls and lambs and rams and goats, while the poor sacrificed birds, doves, things like this. Now listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians eight thirteen. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you're hard pressed. Okay, so that's not the intention. What is the intention? He says, but that there might be equality. Do you remember that God said in the Old Testament early on, there should be no poor among you. Give as you've been given. That's what he's been teaching us. Give freely as you've been freely given. Our desire is not that others may be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn, 
their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. So he says it twice. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. That comes from what I, to- what I spoke to you about earlier, Exodus 16, 18, talking about the manna. This is God's heart, guys. His desire is not that others might be relieved while you're hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Now we're going to see again that this is what God did in Acts. But I want, I want you to notice something, that he's talking about equality. He didn't say our goal is that those at the temple are receiving X, Y, Z. That isn't what he said, did he? Our goal is that the priests become rich. Our goal is that the priests have abundance. He didn't say that. Why? Because something had shifted. That was no longer the temple of God. And Jesus said that soon, not one stone would be left on another. Paul was no longer talking about tithing. What he was talking about is taking out collections for the poor, wasn't he? Or he wouldn't be calling, he wouldn't be talking about equality. So if you're going to a church that's preaching tithing, they're preaching that Jesus, you know, his sacrifice fulfilled all. No more holy days, no more Sabbath, no more. Thanks be to God, you don't have that burden on you anymore. But you need to still pay tithing. What even is that? Everything else that you're supposed to observe is abolished. But one thing that is fulfilled that they don't want to take away they continue to get up there and preach to you. If you are going to a church that does that, you had better consider the fact that the Antichrist is counterfeit Christianity. And if you are more attached to whatever it is that you're attached there, some community, your Sunday Sabbath, you need to know that that's what's in your heart. And that is the thing that will condemn you. As much as I'm suffering right now, I have never preached anything like that to you. Nor have I asked you for anything because I know what I'm doing. And because I know what I'm doing, I trust in God to supply my needs. Listen to what I'm saying. Because I know what I'm doing, I trust in God to supply my needs. I don't need to go manipulate you. So the fact that these people are getting rich off of preaching that message should thoroughly disgust you. And yet many of you are so attached to your counterfeit church, no one can pull you away. And you know what that is, guys? It is the mark of the beast. It is a desire for falsehood because you got something else in it. You're invested in something else. The only thing that matters is the truth because that's the only thing that's going to save. As Paul says, you go seeking any other gospel, you will have believed in vain. What will be the point at the end of it? Now listen to what else Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 19. He's talking about Titus. Actually, I'll start at 16 so you know the context. Thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he's coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. You know, this was the early church, by the way. They were enthusiastic about doing God's work and knowing that they were going to die, by the way. Knowing that they were going to be martyred. Because that's what was going on, guys. They were afraid of the leaders and hiding from them. There were no cathedrals for them to meet in. They were meeting in hiding. And we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. Again, the churches are not denominations. They are assemblies in respective areas. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering, which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself Okay, they're administering, not taking. They're administering in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. Did they take a little on the side? Do you know the only one who took for himself was Judas? So that should tell you something about the spirit in these people who are doing this. We want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift. For we are taking pains to do what is right. Not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of man. Listen, you don't have something to give, okay? Because I don't have finances to give. But I've had computers at my office, iPads, clothing, food. Look at what you have and ask God how he wants you to distribute it. I have a friend who doesn't have anything. 
nothing to give. But through the business that they work for, they're able to get certain materials that they've provided to me, like a garbage disposal. And so they were able to pay for the shipping, though they had to wait until they had the money to pay for that shipping to send me that garbage disposal. And I'm going to tell you something that helped me out so incredibly. And it meant so much to me because I know that they don't have anything. I have another friend who knew that I was waiting until maybe I had some money to be able to buy some wheat berries that I had been wanting to buy. And she sent me a bag of wheat berries because she heard me say that. This is kindness. This is love. This is a desire and an eagerness that God has put into the hearts of those who are his in order that there might be equality, in order that there might be love between us. And these are simple gestures, but they mean a lot. And that friend who sent those wheat berries to me had just left her job because God had been telling her that what she was doing at that job was not of him. How much does this build you up and how much does it make you want to do even more good because of what's been freely given to you? That's the heart that God wants us to have. If I have something and I see a brother or sister in need, how can I watch them in need and not provide and say that the love of God is in me? Now, on the other hand, I gave to someone for years, provided them a place to live so that they could live out the ministry that they told me that that God was calling them to live out. That person did not provide for his own family. He had to be told to contact his own kids. All this time thinking, I'm saved, 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 but who knows what's going on with the children God gave me. What? How? How? And when the tables were switched, when I did not have any money anymore, and now he was at a job, It was not in his own heart to give back to the one who gave to him. How can the love of God be in a person like that? That's the opposite. By the way, that's the same person who said that if they had money, they would give it all to the poor. How can the love of God be in a person like that? Equality, love, blessing. That's what God wants. He wants for our hearts to be brought into a place where what has been freely given to us by him, by him, So it belongs to him. What has been freely given to us by him, we will freely give to others without sitting here being concerned about ourselves and our storehouses and our comforts. I'm going to tell you the truth. After having been a very wealthy woman, that wealth does not bring comfort. Wealth does not bring peace. Living a godly life, that's what's going to bring you comfort and peace because you're not going to be looking over your shoulder and thinking you need to control all of this. You're not going to be handed over to that spirit of greed or compulsion or insatiability of never having enough to make you feel secure. You're going to learn how to live on just enough, not too little, not too much, to be comfortable with that and to trust God that he's going to take care of you. Not to look at the things that pagans look at. Well, I don't have a retirement. What am I going to do? You know what? I remember that person saying that all the time. And if you have been a good parent to the children God has given you, you've taken care of them. They're going to take care of you. But you know what? It's a weird kind of um, consequence, isn't it? That at the end of your life that you live in that perpetual fear because you didn't do what was right. You didn't take care of the children God gave you. So who will take care of you? Acts 4 verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, Those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put them at the the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This is what God wants. Pay attention to what's going on with other believers and whether or not they need your help. Pay attention to what is in your house or your storehouse, 
and ask God, what does he want you to give up? Because if you shrink down now, you will have everything and more. You have no idea. Well, none of us has any idea what God has planned for us. But if we're willing to shrink down now, to lower ourselves, to be humbled, to live in the way that he has commanded, we will have more than we could ever imagine in the coming age. And you remember that Ananias and Sapphira had sold a, their land and they kept back some of the money and they came and laid the rest of the money at the apostles' feet, but they kept back some of the money. And it wasn't human beings necessarily that they were lying to that was the big deal. They're lying to the Holy Spirit. They're lying to God. And Peter rebuked each of them. How has Satan so filled your heart that you would lie about this, that you would lie to God? Was that land not yours? Was it? What, did you not have that in your possession before? What are we supposed to understand that we don't belong? That nothing belongs to us. Everything's been given to us, and if we really believe that, then we will give when God moves us to give. That we will ask Him, "What do you want me to give?" Not just wickedly be like, oh, I hope he doesn't, you know, I'm going to try to ignore him and hope he doesn't tell me to give anything. No, that we will give and be eager to do so. What do you want me to do with these things, Lord? How does this relate to the offering of first fruits and what God brought together in 2 Kings 4? Well, let's read it again. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God 20 loaves of barley bread baked from the first ripe grain along with its, uh, along with some heads of new grain. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. How can I set this before a hundred men, his servant asked. But Elisha answered, give it to the people to eat, for this is what the Lord says. They will eat and have some left over. Then he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. Bring your offering first to God. Bring everything that he has given you first to him. Lord, you've blessed me. You've blessed me with this grain, with this crop, with this harvest. How would you like me to spend it? And there will be enough to share with others, and there will even be some left over. And remember that his desire is not that others are going to be relieved while you're hard pressed, but that there might be equality. And indeed, that you will learn how to give freely of what's been freely given to you that you will learn how to take only the manna that you need for the day and to trust him that he will provide for tomorrow. The offering of first fruits is not about Jesus ascending to the Father. The offering of first fruits is about gratitude to God. It's about remembering what he has taught us as we've been wandering in the wilderness, that when you get to that land, when you get to what he's giving you, what he's blessing you with, that you will thank him first. You will trust him that there's going to be more blessing as long as you're staying with him and you're doing the things he's commanded. That you trust him, that as you're giving to others and that there's equality, that not only will he provide, there won't be too little and there won't be too much, but in some cases there's even some left over. It would have been a very different situation if Andrew, who, you know, let's read the context. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how, are, how far will they go among so many? What, what would have happened if they had said, my goodness, this boy only has five barley loaves and two small fish. There's 12 of us and, and Jesus, 13, and the boy, 14. We need to go hide and eat this because we're hungry too. <laughs> Everyone's hungry and there's five small loaves, guys. You are going to be living through some times that you never thought you'd see next year towards the end of the year, that Antichrist is going to rise and you're going to live through some really hard times. What are you going to do? You're going to take those five loaves and say, oh, I better go hide this away. Because in that case, if you do this by the work of your hands, I can promise you there is nothing 
that will bring wrath like doing something like that. You take this into your own hands, then you can't expect the blessing of God. I can expect the blessing of God, not because of who I am, but because of who he is and what he has promised of those who obey and love him, of those who consider everything that is in their possession to be on loan to them by God. That's why I can expect that God is going to take care of me, that he's going to bless. There's a big difference between knowing what's in your bank account and knowing the treasures that you've stored up in heaven through faith and obedience. Because whenever whatever's in your bank account is gone, it's gone. It doesn't keep giving. There is no loyalty. The bank isn't going to say, well, you've been a good customer. Let's give you this. In fact, they'll... <laughs> My personal experience is the bank was very responsive when I was a wealthy woman. They used to come to my office literally and drop off gifts and things like that. You know, because they wanted a good relationship with those who have a certain amount of money in the bank. And I don't know, it was about a month or two ago, I emailed them about a question that I had, something that I was dealing with. I wanted to change something in one of my accounts and they didn't even bother to respond. <laughs> don't expect any loyalty. Because the only one who cares from us is, for us is God. And in fact, if there are people in our lives who are loyal to us, who have love, it's only because God has placed that in them. He's doing that for them. There are so many situations in which recently there were floods and things like this. And I just think about all of that storing up that people do, you know, the storage that they have in their garage. And here they're, you know, waiting terrified on the roof of their flooded house for someone to come by in a kayak to save them from what just happened. How well do you think the storage fared? So the message of the offering of first fruits, bring to God first. Remember who that belongs to. Remember who gave it to you and why he gave it to you. And if you use what God is giving you correctly, you can expect the blessing of God because of who he is. There will not be too little and there will not be too much. God will be faithful. Please discern this message with God.